On this episode, you're blowing on the bird. I am. We shall consider the birds of the air who neither sow nor reap. By 11, I was picking dead birds up off the road, bringing them home, put them in the freezer. What a disappointing freezer. We'll collect some avian data. I'm sorry. And see what gets an ornithologist excited. This is an extinct bird. It came out of somebody's attic. The North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences is a great place to see some of the nearly 10,000 known species of birds in the world. It is also air-conditioned. But just down the road a piece from that delightfully cool building, you'll find the Prairie Ridge Eco Station, where the museum's lead ornithologist, John Gerwin, is collecting data on a balmy afternoon. How hot's it gonna be today? Uh, 97. Good. Uh, we'll we'll try to quit a little bit before that. Good. That's Maybe my, 94. That's the spirit. Yeah. Around us we have about 30 acres of a restored pasture. It used to be a cow pasture. Now it's what we call an upland prairie or meadow. And further down below we replanted a lot of trees representative of all the species in North Carolina. So we walking? <clears throat> all right. Are we ready? We have a minute here. We have to do a safe meeting with my guys yep. as well. I don't understand. I, for what? In case you've never been around birds, but anything we need to know out here, John, as far as safety, <laughs> big hazards, I guess. We get we get uh, we get some ticks around, you know, and uh, you know, birds bite. Our state bird is the northern cardinal, and they tend to bite. Yeah. How many fatalities a year is the cardinal typically responsible <laughs> yeah. for? Right. A couple dozen a year. A couple dozen. All right, so we got to be careful out there. The state bird is a murderous, murderous avian. It's on a so heads up, everybody, pull your right. throat out. All right, <clears throat> good good work, everybody. I never felt safer. When did uh, birds become your, uh, your thing? When I was about seven. My sister took me out to learn some birds, and it stuck ever since then. I, I just kept watching and got involved in a club with some other nerds like me. You're a bird nerd. I'm a bird nerd, <laughs> and that club that had four years, and that just set. We went out every weekend, every Saturday, looking at birds and other, other things. There's a bird in the black uh, Excuse me. Yeah, go ahead and leave it in the net, and we'll check it out. We're almost there. Thanks. What kind of nets have you set up? These nets are like volleyball nets, um, but they're they're fine, mm -hmm. and, and like a hair net, or even finer, more like the hair actually. So they're nearly invisible when you put them against the vegetation. We don't see them. The birds don't see them. They fly along. They get they get in mesh. It's like a big spider web. Right. The weight of the bird, they collapse into the net. What do they call them? We call them mist nets because they look a little misty. Yeah. Um, especially if they get a little wet. John collects data through a system of his own devising. It looks like it's on this side. In which birds are caught in nets strategically placed throughout this protected grassland. This is a net. So you can see them hanging. They fly in and the weight of the bird causes them to sink right into the sure, net. Sure, it's so light. So that, here it is, mm -hmm. but this is a cat bird. This is a bird that hatched out this year. What kind of bird is this? It's called a house finch, and it is actually a bird of the Southwest. Mm -hmm. They're a popular cage bird, or they were, and in the 40s, there was a shipment that was intercepted. That's, that's what the story is. That a shipment? Yeah, because people were trying to send them overseas. For what purpose? Uh, people keep them as pets. So anyway, the shipment was, the birds were just released instead of sent back in oh. New York, and then they spread up and down the East Coast. How many species of birds are there? Total in the world? Yeah. yeah it's like 10,000, roughly. How many species would you recognize at a glance? Um, maybe 1,500 or so. 1,500 different, different species yeah. at a glance. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, after 30 years of world travel and diligent research, the guy knows his birds. So how many of those nets do you have set up? Today we did 15 and- Hold still for a sec, Ryan. Taylor, keep going. That's <laughs> <laughs> your, your camera, man. <laughs> there we go, you're good. What would I do without my crew? Not much. What would John do without his? About the same. Here's our crew. <laughs> Surprise. Hey guys. Hey guys. Hello. So one of the other things that we do is, is training. These are five of the 
the teenage kid that I've been working with for three or four years now. Aiding him in his daily quest for more and more data, a dedicated group of interns who help him gently trap dozens of birds in the heat of the day. Do you think he remembers the last time he got caught and banded? Do you think their brains are capable of uh, that kind we, of recall? We, we often wonder. We wonder. They seem to have some recall. Short we don't term. know how long yeah. because they avoid nets. We've had some birds that we caught multiple times in a year. Yeah. The behavior changes by the Sometimes fourth time. Day. Yeah, right. That's got to stick with it. They right. just must feel to be like, come on yeah. with the nets again. We can tell for a lot of these birds if they hatch this year, and that's what this one looks like. And we can tell if they're over a year. But mm -hmm. beyond that, there's only a few birds where we can tell after the second year. Other than that, we can't tell by the way they look, but we can, of course, tell if we catch them over and over again. You're blowing on the birds. I am. So it's got some fat to it. It mm -hmm. indicates it's doing well. It's feeding. What you eating? Grubs and stuff? These guys will eat insects and seeds this time of year. They feed the young on uh, insects. They, they've got to have a lot of insects and fat in their diet when they're, when they're growing up, but they will switch to seeds mostly in the fall and winter. John, I hate to be forward, but could I blow on your bird? <laughs> I think he likes it. <laughs> I would enjoy it. We're going to put the, the ring on. It has a number. It's like a social security number. And that way... It's a government bird? It's, it is federal. <laughs> John bans all the birds he catches for tracking purposes and collects all kinds of data in all kinds of ways. They've got a bird, that bird had a ban. All right, so these data are all recorded in a federal national database. Really? So if somebody else catches that bird with that ban, they can send that number in. Sure. And they'll get a report back on where it was caught, when it was caught. You know how to write? Barely. All right. Yeah. John's process is tedious and painstaking work. Eight. Four, one. Break my pencil. I did. I got too excited. But essential for an accurate database that over time can help explain patterns involving migration and disease. You're not just logging this stuff specifically for you because it goes into a federal database. Right. Other, Other pe people disciplines. can use it. Yeah. That's why it's so thorough. You have a cardinal, that's a state bird. That is the state bird. That's the one that bites. Uh, oh, yeah? You definitely need to handle that one. We had a safety <laughs> meeting. We're going to be perfectly fine. What's happening there? Upside down Upside and a prescription down. It tube? It keeps them calm just to get a weight. As long as we're gentle doing it calmly, the bird actually stays pretty calm. Weight varies Sure. by body condition and, and what's going on in the environment, how well they're doing. And so it's 32.8. The weight is a good, another good measure of just how they're doing. So now this bird is ready to be released. And once each bird's been through John's gentle ringer, sorry about all that, we set them free. Whoa, the attack. Poor Dan, after the safety meeting and everything, <laughs> getting right. failed by a cat bird. We come back, we're gonna put a band on it and then let it go and learn stuff. All right. You know what that was, Steve? It was an act break. I've just spent a very moist morning with an extremely knowledgeable ornithologist who just happens to have 1,500 skydives under his belt. We've been catching, tagging, and releasing birds back into the wild to collect data for a federal database on bird behavior to be studied nationwide. It is then, and only then, that we get to head into the air-conditioned comfort of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and focus on dead birds. Lots and lots of stuffed dead birds. This is our specimen prep lab. It's beautiful. Here we skin them out, record more information, we save different parts and stuff them and save them for the collections. For posterity. For posterity. Huh. What a disappointing freezer. From a traditional standpoint, I mean. Yeah, these are some different things we can uh, we can try our luck with. By things, you mean birds. As an aspiring scientist, I'm going to hold you to a certain rigor. These offer different flavors. <laughs> okay, great. A couple kinds of owls. We'll be doing our work in right here. in here. Yeah, right under can... right under this camera. How fortuitous. The bird watching, I understand, but pulling the bird apart and sewing it back up for posterity takes things to a different level, a level that John was apparently born with. 
By eight or nine years old, I was I was watching, and by 11, I was picking dead birds up off the road, bringing them home, putting them in the freezer, much to my mother's dismay. I didn't know enough to clean them out. I just thought, nothing much there. I'll just pin them out and dry them on cardboard, which I did, and then I hung them in my room. That's where it got weird. That's where it got weird, especially when the moths and the other right. beetles found it. That's when mom said, no more. If you want to do that, go to a museum. Which you did, clearly. Which I did. So what's the goal, John? We save whole birds for people to study. To Re preserve Preserving a it, a record, record some data about the body condition and other things. Nowadays, people save some tissue samples from everything because everybody wants to look at genetic stuff, DNA. Yeah. What bird would you like to try, an owl or a hawk? Owls are one of the most popular requests we get for educational, for Maybe wings. Maybe I should work on the owl then. There's four wings and five of us. People, somebody's gonna somebody's come Somebody's gotta do short. a hawk, yeah. <laughs> I'll do it. It's decided. All right. So it's pretty straightforward. In this case, we just need to cut here and clean the meat and tendons out of the wing. But it's pretty interesting to see what goes on sure. in a bird's wing. So we just have to remove the wing. I'm gonna make the first cut here, get things. we to cut the bone. This is a bone crusher. Hopefully I don't crush my own bone. If you do, if I do, we'll go ahead and stuff it. <laughs> What's the goal, John, from an artistic standpoint? What are we trying to do? We are trying to get the muscles out. There are probably like 10 different muscle tendon groups. Mm -hmm. And we need to get that out or it'll rot if we want to preserve it. With that clean, we can then sew it up, pin the wing out so it dries in this extended position. Ah. Edward, you have two pairs of scissors over there. What are you? <laughs> Edward, you have like scissor hands. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jealous, aren't you? <laughs> Wish you'd said it. <laughs> John works here. He has to do this. But why are these kids so fascinated by the prospect of stuffing dead birds on a Saturday? Jolly, wh wh why is this guy good? Well, he knows a lot. So he's been doing it for like 100 years or so. <laughs> so, so he really knows. I mean, he's really good at teaching you how to do everything. So. You know, within a couple of weeks, you can teach you how to skin a full bird, and then, mm. and then you can, he just kind of sets you free, and you can do whatever you want. So unique. Um, a lot of really good experience that I can use to get like a, like a really cool bird field work job next summer. Because like a lot, not not a lot of other kids my age get to get the experience to bird band. So this is really special. Are we in need of more young people enthused and passionate about the study of birds, or do we have enough? Do we have to let one of these go? <laughs> I'm encouraged by having six of them hang around. That's actually a lot, but chances are if we started asking or looking around, we'd find more people that were interested. There's, they just don't always have an outlet. Right. Not every place you can go when you're a teenager and find a program or an, an opportunity like this. So, You know, to, to actually have your vocation and your avocation meet, you've got to be as afflicted as you were at seven. Yeah, I mean, it helps. This is a low-paying job with long hours, and, but you choose to do them. So, yeah, I think you need a lot of curiosity and, and a certain passion. It's not always about money. That's worth repeating. Curiosity and passion, not money, brought John to where he is today. Something to ponder behind the feathers of a wise old owl. After a muggy morning of collecting scientific bird data, I'm in the basement of the Raleigh Museum of Science, disassembling owls. If you're just joining us, we're gonna go ahead and take a needle and thread and wrap up the top part of the uh, owl wing. I believe we're looking at the uh, ulna and the uh, radius. radius. Not unlike the uh, bones in your own forearm. They were surrounded by feathers. And if that's the case for you, you should, um, you should get to a hospital immediately. <laughs> All right, this is a, they didn't have a straight one for me, so they gave me this thing. This is the proper needle? I like this. Then why is yours straight? Because I thought you'd enjoy having the curved one to be different. <laughs> Where's that thread? I better give him more thread. Pretty sure that's perfectly designed to sail through my finger. Where's Dan? 
Can we have another quick safety meeting? Absolutely. I'm working with a needle. Any any threats or? Uh... You're not gonna want to poke yourself with that needle. <laughs> also, I see some scissors on the table. Yeah. Uh, you want to hold those away from you. Not not with the sharp end. Right. Don't run with them. Right. I need to sign something now. Yeah. You want to? <laughs> now that I feel perfectly safe, time to roll out the hard hitting questions. Your favorite Alfred Hitchcock movie? <laughs> Rock and roll band from the. Uh, from the 60s, uh, long before you were born. I know this one. It's pretty easy. Say the first noun that comes to mind. Birds. Yes, the yes, birds. The birds. The birds. <laughs> the birds. <laughs> That's correct. Spell roll the Y, but yeah. the oh, well. True. I'm glad that drew. What was your favorite game to play as a very small child outside with your friends in a circular configuration that required a modest amount of exercise. <laughs> duck, duck, goose. That's correct! <laughs> now I'm off to see John's inner sanctum, where all of his prized specimens are kept under impenetrable security. 4167. Welcome. We have cabinets full of dead things. Today, I'm lucky enough to experience something truly thrilling. Bye. Bird nerd standards. Hey guys, there it is. Holy moly. I want to take a look at this. What do you got? So this came in, this just came in, and it was a donation. And I just wanted to double check the uh, we have a we have a similar one over here that's mounted. I want to take a look real quick. What is it? That's what I'm checking. You actually you don't you don't know what this is? <sighs> well I thought it was a wimbrel, but the bill is so short. Where's a wimbrel up there? Finally found something that John is not positive of. Let me take a quick look over here. It just, I just couldn't tell from the bill, you know. I think that's it. Wow. That's How amazing. old is it? Yeah, so that's a great one. That's, that's a donation. It came out of their yeah. attic. What? Wait, let's go compare. No. That's why I gotta go to compare. I mean, I couldn't it came out of somebody's attic. I just wanted to see if the, if the bill was similar at all. It's because, man, that's pretty darn close. So, wow, this is an extinct bird. Mm -hmm. And this just, they, we had a donor contact us last week and they sent a photograph. And when I looked at the photograph, I thought it could be a, a, an Eskimo curlew. What's the significance? It's extinct. It, so you yeah. found an extinct bird, but it, since it's mounted and whatnot, it's- Right, but somebody could still take some skin off of it to do some analysis or off the feather, you know, they might want to do some really? studies. Yeah, I mean, you can get DNA out of these things. We even have a lab now that can do what's called um, ancient DNA, but we can- You saw Jurassic something. Park. I, I did. You understand what you're, right, I know. What you're messing with here, okay? It's up to them. It's up to them. I'm retired. Guys, I'm <laughs> don't, come on. I, you, we've right. read the stories about non-indigenous invasive species, et cetera, et cetera. Let's not take that genie out of the bottle. And that, right there, if you're wondering, is the whole point of the show. I look for people like John who happily spend 30 years doing what they love and then spend the rest of their life looking for ways to pass that passion down to a new generation. Hopefully, birthing purpose and launching a few more satisfying careers. I think historically, a lot of science was behind the scenes and now we're bringing it forward. And it's blending with doing more with the public. And yet, there just aren't a lot of jobs for it, but I think there's a need for it. That's why we're here. This but. thing must have flown in circles its whole life. <laughs> <laughs>